In this video, we'll take a closer look at the value provided by the somewhat similarly performing four video cards. And while most of you can correctly anticipate the conclusion that the DirectX 12 GTX cards are the better choice when buying used, the mechanism on how we get to that conclusion might help you get a better feel of your own local market. Stay tuned. The method used here has these steps. Obtain a performance number for each card. Obtain a price for each card. More on that later in the video. And finally, compare them using a metric for value by dividing the performance to price. We then took one more step to figure out what would be a reasonable price for each card. More on that towards the end of the video. For the performance numbers, the plan is to use the sum of the average FPS across 4 single player games and 5 multiplayer games. I use the good old Z230 workstation from HP. It has an i7-4770 equivalent Xeon CPU and 32GB of DDR3 running at 1600MHz in dual channel. We use the 1080 resolution and lowest settings possible for all games, except render scaling. When available, it's at 100%. In Doom Eternal, my big surprise was how the GTX 770 and R9-80 ran. The Nvidia card did not exhibit the problems that Kepler was famous for when running Vulkan titles. The R9-80 did run the game, but the visual glitches were getting worse and worse as the game progressed, to the point where whole sections of the screen would flicker. Unfortunately though, the Kepler card failed to launch Resident Evil 4, so between the two older cards, both managed to screw up a game each. The Maxwell and Pascal cards so far have no problems and keep racking in the FPS. Far Cry 6 is another miss for the Kepler card, and that will end up hurting the performance number for it. All the other three cards, however, run the single player title without crashes or glitches. I for one was impressed that the older Radeon was able to stay close to the more modern Nvidia cards. Control is the last single player title selected to test these cards, and the Radeon provides another surprise with a strong 66 FPS on average. The GTX 960 is also making a good impression, having the best 1% lows value. Multiplayer titles rely a lot on gamers returning to play again and again, so while their gameplay is more demanding in terms of the desired FPS, they also tend to use the older DirectX 11 rendering API since that allows them access to a larger pool of hardware that can run the game. This also means that even the older Kepler cards can still prove to be effective. And the first game to drive that home is Battlefield 5. The R9-80 leads the Nvidia cards by 10 FPS on average. As for the GeForce cards, you'd be hard pressed to tell which is which, ignoring the labels on the graph, of course. Apex Legends, however, seems to put all the cards in their place, with the two more modern GeForce cards performing at more than 100 fps on average. The Radeon stays close to them, at 94 fps on average. Counter-Strike 2 is unfortunately a poor test, at least on the Z230 workstation. Even though the selected 4 cards are of a similar performance level, the only way that you'd get this type of graph is if you run a CPU bottleneck. And as discussed in the review of the 1050 Ti, this is actually the case here. While all 4 cards average above 100 FPS in performance mode in Fortnite, it is the two more modern GeForce cards that will provide a smooth gaming experience. At 70 FPS and 81 FPS, the GTX 960 and 1050 Ti will provide a much better gaming experience. And finally, the finals. In the dedicated video for this game, while the GTX 770 had a bad 1% boost at 1080, 9720 resolutions had the card performing alright. Quite obviously though, the DirectX 12 GeForce cards lead the pack. As mentioned before, we choose the sum of the average FPS as our performance indicator, and the graph seen on the screen right now comes to no surprise. The younger the architecture, the higher the performance. And in case of GCN and its contemporary rival, Kepler, the poorer the DirectX feature level support, the poorer the performance score, due to crashes and failure to launch. These numbers are quite important, since they reflect the objective numerator of the value proposition that each card has. Price, however, is determined by the market, and because of this, is the subjective denominator for the value proposition. To gauge this, I used an average price. Searching for each card, I sorted the results in ascending order for price. I then took the first 5 ads for cards in good working condition and averaged their prices. While the price of the GTX 770 turned out lower than what I remembered, 
the 62 USD for an R9280 sticks out like a sore thumb. This old, no longer supported 3GB Radeon costs, on average, 5 USD more than a 4GB 1050Ti that not only receives driver support, but also has a third of the TDB. <laughs> My market is crude. The obvious step is to now divide the performance metric, the total average FPS, to the price, and that will give us the value metric. The low price of the GTX 770 makes it the value king GPU, with the Pascal and Maxwell cards following closely. As for the R9280, this graph makes it look to be quite overpriced. Question is, by how much? What we're going to do next is to deduce the price by using an average value of, of around 12 FPS per USD, that is the average across this graph, and the performance values presented earlier. This then gives the final graph in this video, along with our conclusions. Dividing each performance metric by that 12 FPS per USD average value mentioned, we get the price values on the red bars. The blue bars represent the original average price that we presented a couple of steps back. It's now clear that in my neck of the woods, people are trying to get rid of the GTX 770 and the asking price for it is lower than what we've computed as an expected price. Both the GTX 960 and 1050 Ti seem to be going for what they are worth, which gives me hope for the state of my local market. But the R9 to 80 has to come down in price a bit. As for the conclusion, the short answer is the same as in the intro. Get the 960 or better yet the 1050 Ti. The long answer, however, is more complicated. Multiplayer-only gamers can still use their Kepler GPUs if they still have them. But ideally, you do your own price research. You can then use the performance numbers from this video and then deduce the FPS per USD value according to your own market. You'll then be able to gauge if a card is overpriced or a deal, and even by how much. The cards shown here will quite likely show up in other videos here on the channel. Make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out. As for this one, well, we're done. I hope you liked it and hopefully I'll see you.